Two years ago, my husband was sick for three weeks with a sinus infection or flu-like symptoms. He went to the doctors multiple times and they prescribed him different antibiotics each time. He didn't get any better. One weekend, he slept from Friday to Monday, only waking up occasionally to use the restroom. The next day, Tuesday, he was sleeping in the living room while I was in our bedroom. I could hear him having a conversation, so I assumed he was on the phone. All of a sudden, it sounded like he was yelling, so I rushed into the living room, only to find him sleeping. I went back to the room, and a few minutes later, I heard him speaking again. It sounded like he was calling me, so again, I rushed into the living room and asked, Are you calling me? His eyes popped open. He looked at me and said, They won't let me sleep. I keep asking them to please let me sleep. He was very sick and speaking tired him out easily. He closed his eyes as I asked, Who won't let you sleep? He replied, Dead people. I keep seeing dead people. I said, Like the sixth sense. He nodded and said, They're here in the living room. I scanned the living room with fear. They're asking me for help. They want me to give messages to their families. I keep asking them to leave me alone. I just want to sleep. A lot of them are speaking Spanish and I'm telling them, I'm sorry, I don't understand you. We live in a predominantly Hispanic city. I felt his forehead and he was burning up. I took him to the ER and they did his lab work. The normal white blood cell count is 4 to 11,000. My husband's white blood cell count was 400,000. He is diagnosed with empal leukemia. The doctors couldn't believe he was alive, let alone conscious. They said he should have been in a coma or dead. My husband never had any dreams like that before getting sick. He saw dead people again, one more time while he was in the hospital, before he had a cold blue episode. It was the same thing, them asking him for help. I often wonder, were these hallucinations caused by delirium, or was my husband on the bridge between life and death? That because he was on the cusp, the veil was somewhat lifted. The first story is about a weird time loop. She and her cousin were driving down this road to go get some water, since there was also a natural spring around there. On their way back, their car stalls out and just won't start up again. This happened back in the 80s, so there were no cell phones you could use to call for help. So they started walking. They weren't too far, and they had plenty of daylight left, so it was fine. But as they're walking, they see another car stopped in the distance. They think, oh cool, We can get a ride from these guys, but as they got closer, they see that it's the same make and model of their car. They get even closer and they realise that, no, it's the same car. They're confused as hell, but can completely verify that it's their car by looking in the windows. The sweater she left in the back seat. The empty pop can her cousin was drinking out of. Everything inside was exactly as they left it, and they honestly just didn't know what to do. They hadn't turned off the dirt road at all. They hadn't even walked far enough to make it to another trail they could turn off. They thought it was weird, but figured they should just keep walking as if that's all they could do. They keep going and sure enough, up ahead down the road, there's a car parked. The same as before. This time, they're tripping out and they run up to it and it's 100% their car again. Her cousin gets a stick from the woods and leaves it on the hood of the car saying that if they keep walking and the same things happen, they can at least see if the stick would be moved. They take off walking and it happens again. This time, the stick is gone and they're like, what the fuck? She described feeling afraid that the loop would just go on forever, but it didn't. The next time they walked down the road, they realized they were able to walk further and eventually made it back to the res. They got help and towed the car but never got an explanation or figured out what really happened. She has no idea why the stick that they left on the hood of the car disappeared. They really have zero idea, and neither do I. The second story is about a UFO sighting she had with some friends on that same road. 
This happened years later after the first incident, maybe early 90s, and it was during the summertime. She and her friends were riding around in a car, having a few beers and listening to music. One of the friends commented that there must be a four-wheeler in the woods, but that it's weird since there's no trail there. They look to see what he's talking about, and all you see are these white lights emanating from deep in the woods. You can see that there's a source of light, but you can't see the object itself through the trees. The driver slows down and turns down the music. She described that there wasn't anything too alarming about what they were seeing at that point, but that there was a feeling that something wasn't right, and she said that everyone felt it because all of them got quiet as they looked out the windows, which were wide open. When things got quiet, they were able to hear a low humming. She had a hard time describing the humming, just that it was very low, but almost felt like ringing in the ears. They all heard it. They were silent looking at the lights, but then whatever it was shot up directly into the sky and they saw a UFO. This was so long ago, I wish I could describe more about how it looked, but she did say that the second it shot into the sky, it changed into all sorts of colours that seemed to rotate around the craft. It paused right above the tree line for a few seconds and then just took off right into the horizon, lights changing again when it moved. When my wife of 17 years decided to leave me for some guy she met online, moved to some bumfuck town in Tennessee to be with him, and laughingly threw divorce papers in my face when she left, I thought my life was over. Now, during the divorce hearings, which my wife, or ex-wife, had to drive back from Tennessee to attend, the topic of alimony came up. At that time, I only made a little over 1200 a month after taxes as a janitor and baggage handler at the local airport in town. It was a very small airport. There was just me and another guy, as well as the owner that worked there at the time. Actually, it was categorised by the FAA as a basic airport. We just called it local. Anyway, we, ha we housed small propeller planes, like crop dusters, personal use planes, things like that. The terminal was actually a double-wide trailer. Well, a modular home, if you want to be politically correct. Which I don't. I haven't been politically correct my whole life, so I'm not about to start now. Anyway, it was a three-bedroom trailer. One room was Mr. Reynolds' office. The second room was for storage. The third room, well, it didn't have a purpose. It was completely empty. The waiting area was what would have been the living room. The kitchen was a little snack and drink station, and of course there was a bathroom. Now, back to the divorce hearings. Wouldn't you know, my wife or ex-wife was kind enough to take half of that 1200 for alimony, claiming she was single and unable to work to support herself due to severe IBS. You know, irritable bowel syndrome. She was lying, but the judge believed her anyway. Now, after the divorce was finalized, I had to move out of the house we were renting, simply because, without having another income coming in, I couldn't afford it anymore. The rent alone was $850. That was more than I even brought home a month after the alimony payment. I left almost everything behind. Most of it was hers anyway, and I sure as hell didn't want it. I packed an old duffel bag with my work uniforms, a couple pairs of socks and underwear, some t-shirts and a couple pairs of jeans, as well as my phone charger, my toothbrush, toothpaste, razor and shaving cream. I put all my CDs, DVDs and the DVD player in large Scots paper towel box that I got from the creepy old grocery store in town. I then threw the duffel bag in the trunk and gently placed the box in the front seat of my car. After I moved out, I slept in the car for about a week or so in the parking lot of the airport and took an Amish bath in the bathroom every morning. Don't judge. The morning after the last night I slept in my car, which was a Friday morning, I was mopping the floor in the waiting area when the owner of the airport, Mr. Reynolds, came up to me. Mr. Reynolds is an older gentleman, mid to late 60s, married with three grown children and a really nice guy. He's the reason I stayed working there. Anyway, he came up to me and said, 
Hey, Richie. I know it's none of my business. I'm just worried about you, son. But you, were you sleeping in your car this morning when I came in? I was a little embarrassed to answer, but I finally did. Yes, sir, I said, and hung my head, feeling small. He just stood there. It's a long story, sir, I said, still hanging my head. Come back to my office, Richie. Let's talk about it, if you don't mind. This floor can wait, he said. I told you he was a nice guy. Anyway, I put the mop in the bucket, pushed it over into a corner, and then followed him back to his office. He opened the door, walked in and said, have a seat, Richie. So I did. That was the first time that I'd ever been in his office. It was your normal, outdated office. There was a huge grey metal desk in the middle of the room with My Little Pony stickers on the front of it. I don't want to know why those were there. On top of the desk sat an old Radio Shack TRS-80 computer on the front right corner. A framed picture of his wife and kids next to it, a desktop calendar in the middle, a coffee cup with pens in it, and a microcom radio. At least that's what I call it. I'm sure there's a real name for it, I just don't know what it is. It's basically a high-frequency radio used to communicate between planes in the terminal. Anyway, they both sat on the left side of the desk. There were three filing cabinets in the right corner of the room, with a coffee pot on top of the first one, a file sorter, full of files on top of the second one, and a small oscillating fan on top of the third tan carpet on the floor, wood panelling on the walls, and a white hard foam ceiling like you would find in any mobile home. A large fake plastic plant sat in the left corner of the room, with 8x10 pictures of vintage airplanes on the wall surrounding it, as well as a large picture window directly behind the desk, giving a clear view of the only runway. Anyway, he sat down in his big brown leather chair, cupped his hands together, leaned forward on the desk and said, I can see you're upset, and I don't mean to pry, but what's going on? I took a deep breath let it out and replied, well sir, um, my wife left me, took half my cheque for alimony, I can't afford a place anymore, so I've been sleeping in my car, sir. He just looked at me with an oh my god look on his face. He then sat back in his chair. Richie, he said, how long have you been working here? Over 15 years, sir, I replied. 15 years? That's a long time. Even longer than I've been here. You never complain about anything. You never call out and you do everything I ask. In my book, that grants you a little more privilege, he said. Privilege, sir? I questioned. Now, it's not much, but it's better than your car. There's an old tool shed out back that the groundskeepers used to use. It's a pretty good sized shed. It's got electricity and a linoleum floor. There may be some old tools in there. I think there's a folding cot out there as well. If not, I'll find you one. Why would there be a folding cot and a tool shed, I thought. Anyway, it's all yours, for as long as you need it. A week, a month, a year, ten years even, if you want it, that is, he finished saying. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate it. The back seat is killing my back, I replied excitedly. Come on, I'll show you where it is, he said, standing up and motioning for me to come with him. As I got up, the microcom began to make a loud, sharp, staticky sound a few times and then stopped. It scared the shit out of me. I jumped. It does that sometimes, Mr. Reynolds said dismissively. Come on. I just stared at the microcom with a what the hell look on my face. After a few seconds, I snapped back to reality. With all my years of working here, I've never seen a tool shed out back, I thought. We walked out of the office, out the back door down the steps and towards the runway. After about 10 minutes of walking, I saw it. Now, when you think of the words tool and shed, you think of a small little four foot by seven foot structure, right? Well, this thing was almost as big as the terminal. It was eight feet in width and 17 feet in length. And yes, I measured it. It was huge as far as tool sheds go, that is. It had wood paneling all the way around it, not that mobile home panelling like what was in Mr. Reynolds' office. No, that unfinished wood panelling that you get at Lowe's. Anyway, someone had painted it white and trimmed it with one by fours painted black. The doors were the same way. It was sharp looking. 
There were two small windows with sliding panels so you could open them on either side of the doors, which were directly in the middle of the front of it and opened outward to either side. There were two more windows, one on each side of the shed and two more in the back. And get this, it actually had a real roof. It was a peaked roof with real roof shingles like you would see on an actual house. Now I had actually seen that thing before, but I didn't think it was a tool shed. I thought it was one of those little houses that you see on TV and that someone was actually living in it. It was that nice. Here you go, Richie. It's all yours, Mr. Reynolds said, patting me on the back. Go ahead. Check it out. I opened the doors to see that the interior of the shed was completely drywalled and painted white, even the ceiling, with several electric wall sockets on the bottom of each wall. There was an old rusty saw, an eight-foot ladder, and a few saw horses in the far right back corner. And yes, there was a small folding cot leaned up against the wall in the front left corner. Oh my God, I said, completely amazed. It's like a little studio apartment. How much do you want for it, sir? I asked. Not a thing, he replied. Like I said, it's all yours. And take the rest of the day and the weekend off with pay, of course. You've had a rough time lately. Get some rest and I'll see you on Monday. Really, really nice guy. Oh, thank you, sir. I've got a little bit of money on me. I'm going to run down to Wally World and get some sheets and a pillow, sir. Thanks again, I said excitedly. I'll walk back with you, he said, as he turned around and began to walk towards the terminal. I followed closely behind. We said our goodbyes as he walked in the terminal and I continued to the parking lot. I got in my car and went to Wally World, got some twin sheets, a pillow and a pillowcase like I said, and then made an unplanned stop at my old house. Technically, the month wasn't over yet, and I was paid up until the first. So legally, it was still my house. Anyway, I walked in, grabbed the TV, the coffee pot, and all the fixings. A few gallons of spring water, the microwave, some food, the mini fridge we kept in the bedroom, my dresser, a blanket, and the little blue table that sat in the hallway. It was my ex-wife's, but screw it, I needed a table, as well as the dolly that was in the laundry room that I used to move my dresser. How did I fit all that in my car, you ask? Well, my car was actually a 98 Chevy Blazer, so that's how. Anyway, I got back to the airport, unloaded my car, and put it all in my new place, including my box of DVDs and stuff. Now pulling the dolly across the grass while walking backwards and trying not to drop the dresser was fun. That's a joke by the way. Anyway, I arranged everything the way I wanted it. I unfolded the cot, put the sheets on and the pillowcase, hooked the DVD player up to the TV, laid on the cot and watched a marathon of earnest movies thinking, I have everything I need right here in this shed. Well except for a bathroom, but luckily there was one of those porta bossy things close by. I don't know why it was there, but I was sure glad it was, especially in the mornings. Now I laid around all weekend, watching movies, old TV shows I recorded, drinking coffee and eating on occasion. I called Mr. Reynolds on Saturday to get my schedule and he had me on all five nights, Monday through Friday. I didn't really care though, the night shift is easy, because no one else there. You gotta clean up, turn on the runway lights, and listen for pilots to call in and assist them if needed. Easy, right? You see, I don't care when I work, just as long as I work. Now I walked to the terminal Monday afternoon, a little before three o'clock, punched in and went to work. Said hi and bye to the other guy, I think his name is Dave or something. Got my instructions for the night from Mr. Reynolds, then said bye to him as well. You see, the terminal is closed between 11pm and 7am. If you fly in or out during those times, you're on your own. Anyway, the night was going well. I turned on the runway lights at about 7 o'clock. No planes had come in and none had flown out. I was cleaning up Mr. Reynolds' office at his request when it happened. It was about 9.30 at the time. The overhead light in the office dimmed just a little, then came back to normal. Power surge, I thought, and just blew it off. Seconds later, the microcom began to make another loud, sharp, staticky sound. This time, it didn't stop. No, it continued. 
I walked over to the desk and just stared at it. What the fuck? I said to myself. I then began to hear some very low screams coming from within the static. Not over the static, in the static. I'd never heard anything like that before. It was quite unnerving. The volume of the screams grew louder with every passing second until they were almost at a fever pitch. I covered my eyes and screamed, stop, as loud as I could. Then it just stopped. I removed my hands from my ears. Dead silence. What the fuck just happened, I thought, starting to get concerned. Okay, it's a glitch. It's old equipment. Maybe there's a crossed wire somewhere, I said to myself, trying to rationalise what just happened. I took a deep breath, let it out, and continued cleaning the office, still a little freaked out. I began singing to myself to try and calm my nerves. I forget what song I was singing. Well, it doesn't really matter. Anyway, I was really getting into it. Then the microcom started up again. There was a loud popping sound, but then the overhead light began to flicker, like a strobe light on steroids. Mayday! 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 I'm declaring an emergency. Clear your runway now. I'm coming in. A very intense male voice said from the microcom. I quickly looked out the window to see nothing but the runway lights. No planes on approach and none on the runway. What the fuck, I thought. The overhead light then went out. The runway lights went out as well. I was standing there in complete darkness. I screamed, pulled my phone out of my pocket, turned on the flashlight and quickly made my way to the door, completely scared out of my mind. I was just about to grab the knob when I turned back for some reason, just as this incredibly bright white light filled the entire room. I threw myself back against the door, closing my eyes, covering them with both of my hands, and falling down into a slitting position. Now we've all had bright lights shined in our eyes a few times in our lives, right? We covered our eyes, and could always tell when the light was gone, even with your eyes completely covered, right? Well, I sat there with my eyes completely covered for a good two minutes. Then the light was gone. I uncovered my eyes and opened them. The overhead light was back on in the office. Now, what I saw standing there behind the desk was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. The only way I can describe it is not of this planet. It had pale gray skin, it was tall, extremely tall. So tall that I had to lean over so that it could fit in the eight foot high room. It was quite menacing. It was completely bald with two big bulging jet black eyes that didn't blink. There were two small holes where a nose should have been with no mouth and no ears. Its neck was about two feet long with some kind of knob or button on the right side of it. It was extremely skinny with legs about six feet long and arms about six feet long as well. It had elongated fingers. I couldn't see its toes. They were behind the desk. It had what looked to be two small speakers side by side in the middle of its chest with a red indicator light under the speaker on the left and a green indicator light under the speaker on the right. I was completely, absolutely and utterly horrified. I screamed repeatedly fearing for my life. Don't kill me, please don't kill me, I screamed. That thing then tilted its head to the side and began to speak as the red light began to flash. Now the language that it spoke sounded like a cat coughing up a hairball. I stopped screaming and listening to it. A sense of calmness fell over me as I rose to my feet and stood there staring at this thing as it stared back at me still speaking. It stopped speaking and just stared at me. I can't understand you, I said calmly. It then reached up with its right hand and pressed the button on its neck. Another staticky sound came from its chest and then it began to speak. This time, I understood every word. Greetings, Earthling. My name is... Something I couldn't understand. I am the ruler of the planet Zemplar. I come in peace. I wish you no harm. But make no mistake, I will kill you if I have to, it said. What do you want, I asked. I and the beings of my planet seek refuge here on planet Earth. 
Refuge from what? Now, never in my life did I ever imagine that I'd be having an intelligent conversation with an extraterrestrial being, but it was happening. From annihilation, my planet has come under attack by those seeking to take the only resource my planet has, water. So, you all want to come here? Nearly 75% of planet Earth is covered in water, and since I and the beings on my planet are made up of water, we will almost certainly survive here. Is she going to kill everyone on this planet and take it over? That is not our intention. We are civilized beings that intend to live among the people of your planet. How? We are far more advanced than any human here on Earth. We possess the power to alter our appearance. We can make ourselves look just like you Earthlings. As I stood there, I watched as whatever its name was, shifted into what I can only describe as a human man, fully dressed and wearing glasses. He then waved at me. How the hell? I began to say as it shifted back. Fucking cool, I stated. If you will allow myself and the beings of my planet to come to Earth, using this portal and live amongst you humans, saving the entire population of my planet, I will grant you the ability to achieve all of your desires, however big or small they may be. I thought about it for a while and then said, hell yeah, I'll do it. But you can only come at night. No one will see you then. Agreed, it replied. I then extended its right arm, extended its finger as well, and slowly moved towards me. I thought we made a deal, I screamed, as its finger touched my chest and then withdrew. I stood there trembling uncontrollably. Make a wish, it said. I slowly stopped trembling and said, I want a cup of coffee. I blinked my eyes, and when I opened them again, there was a cup of fresh brewed hot coffee with cream and sugar, sitting in an all-white coffee cup on the edge of Mr. Reynolds' desk. I was completely ecstatic. I picked it up and took a drink. It was the best tasting coffee I'd ever had. Satisfied, it said. Uh-huh, I replied. Whatever its name was then shifted back into the man and looked out the office window. I went and stood beside him. As I looked out the window, I saw the runway lights were back on. I also saw hundreds, if not thousands of people walking down the runway and heading toward the terminal. There were men, women, teenagers and young children, as well as older men and women, all dressed differently and from dif different ethnic backgrounds. Are they all from your planet, I asked. They most certainly are. They've all adapted physical traits that will help them blend amongst the people of your planet. Thank you, my friend, he said sincerely, putting his left hand on my left shoulder and extending his right hand to me. I then shook hands with him. This is merely a fraction of the beings on my planet. It will take several months, even years, human time. That is, for all of them to arrive. I trust you'll be here to assist with them with that. I certainly will, I replied. All the people then walked past the window, some waving, some not, and then they just disappeared. Where did they go, I asked. To different parts of your planet, he replied. Thank you again, my friend. And then he disappeared himself. I just stood there. What the actual fuck just happened, I thought. I then looked at the coffee cup on the desk and smiled. I finished my shift, locked up, and went back to my shed. I had the best night's sleep I'd had in a long time. I got up the next morning, and just for shits and giggles, I wished for a 1957 Chevy. I walked out the parking lot, and there it was, right where my blazer was parked. Now, to make an incredibly long story short, I went to work that night. Didn't say anything to Mr. Reynolds or to Dave, and the same thing happened that night, all the same time. Well, except the May Day call. I don't know what that was about. Anyway, it happened again on Wednesday night, and again Thursday night. Friday morning, I went to Mr. Reynolds and asked him to put me on the night shift seven days a week, for straight pay of course. He was a little confused, but he agreed. He cut my hours back from 3 till 11 to 5.30 till 11. I was fine with that. As time went on, I used my new gift to get a few things for myself and to help a few people out. Since Mr. Reynolds was so nice to me, I figured it was about time he retired and spent his remaining years with his wife and family. I wished for a million dollars in a brown duffel bag, got it, carried it to his office and made him a deal he couldn't refuse. One million dollars cash 
to sell me the airport. He didn't even hesitate or even question where I got the money from. He just opened the top left drawer of his desk, pulled out the deed, signed it, grabbed the bag and left. He sends me a family photo postcard from different parts of the globe every now and then. I know he's happy. The new arrivals come every single night now and have been for quite some time. Anyway, I shut down the airport, as a business that is, so I can focus on helping my new friends. I gave Dave $100,000 when I did and wished him the best. Come to find out, his real name is Earl. I always thought it was Dave. Anyway, I moved out of the shed and into the terminal. Well, what was the terminal? I fully furnished it by using my gift. I put a few more sheds out back, 17 to be exact. I had them built just like the first one. I used them for any of the arrivals that want to stay in town. It looks like a little housing development out there. Now I don't know how many people I've let come to this planet. Thousands, maybe tens of thousands, and they all look like us. Maybe the old lady standing behind you at the grocery store. Maybe your co-worker is one of them. Maybe the guy or girl you took home from the bar last night. Who knows? I can't tell. Now remember when I said that I thought my life was over when my ex-wife left me? I was wrong. My life now has a purpose. Helping others. Oh yeah, speaking of my ex-wife, she called me a couple days ago and said that the guy she left me for left her for some 20-year-old blonde bimbo and that she was recently diagnosed with severe IBS, for real this time. Then she started crying and asked if she could come home. I hung up on her. What? I had nothing to do with it, I swear. You believe me, right? When I was 16, my family moved into a new house and it was the first time all of us kids would get our own rooms. My parents said I would pick my room first because I'm the oldest, but I decided just to take whatever room was left. I wasn't home except to sleep between work, school and football, so I didn't care how big my room was or anything. The day we moved in, I kind of just set my stuff in a corner of the living room while everybody else chose their rooms and helped my parents unload all of our stuff. You can probably imagine my surprise when I found out the only room that hadn't been picked was the biggest beside the master bedroom. To be honest, I didn't know what to do with all of the space. We just came from a house where there was barely enough room to walk because of all of my siblings' beds were crammed next to mine. And now I had a room all to myself that was even bigger than the one I had to share. Once I had all of my stuff set up and organized, I went to find my dog so we could watch a movie in my room. We had been watching movies together ever since we got her six years before, so this was a pretty regular occurrence. I found her chilling in the living room after a day of running around in the backyard and called for her to follow me after picking a movie out of our collection. She followed me until we hit my brother's room and wouldn't come any further. My room was at the end of the hallway and was part of the original house. Everything except for my room and the dining room was an add-on so there was a fair bit of distance between my room and all of the others. I figured that it was because she hadn't explored everything yet and just needed time to adjust to the new place, so I just shrugged it off and watched my movie alone. Later that night, I was in the dead of sleep when I randomly woke up and found myself staring into the darkness and wondering what had woken me up. I hit the button on my alarm clock and once my eyes adjusted to its blinding blue glow, I saw that it was a little after 1.30 a.m. When my arm left the comforts of my blanket to activate the light on my clock so I could read the time, I became immediately aware of how cold it was in the room. October in Arizona is nothing like anywhere else in the US. You can still comfortably wander around outside in a tank top and shorts if you want, because it normally only gets down to around 80 degrees Fahrenheit at night, but it had to have been in the high 50s or low 60s in there. Over the next couple of weeks, this continued to happen, despite the fact that the thermostat was set to 75 degrees every night, and other things started happening as well. I was always uneasy being in that room alone, so I eventually convinced my dog to sleep at the foot of my bed one night to make me feel a bit better. She stayed there the whole night. 
but she seemed pretty stressed. And when I got up to let her outside in the morning, she just refused to go to that side of the house at all. At this point, I was starting to have stuff go missing like homework assignments and pencils that would show up where I left them a couple of days later. And it felt like when someone is looking over your shoulder and you can just feel their gaze. It even got to the point where I couldn't have the closet door slid open because it just made the whole room feel off when it was open. After a month a month of this, I just started crashing on the couch in the living room and avoiding going in my room unless I absolutely needed to. After I had been sleeping on the couch for about a week, my brother decided he wanted to switch rooms since I wasn't really using it anyway and he had a lot more stuff than me. And even though I tried to tell him it was a bad idea, we switched rooms. I didn't have anything weird happen in my new room and he hadn't said he noticed anything, so I figured that I'd been on edge for nothing until a couple of days later. One night, I heard banging coming from my old room and figured my brother was just moving things around. He was a night owl, so this wasn't altogether an uncommon thing for him to do. The next morning, he looked absolutely drained and I asked what he expected, if he was going to be up all night banging around. He kind of gave me a sideways glance and asked me what I was talking about. When I said that I could hear him moving stuff around all night, the colour drained from his face a little bit. I asked him what was up, but he denied anything was, and we just went on with our day. I started noticing that he was more moody than usual, and seemed to be sleeping a lot more during the day. My mom started picking up on it as well, and we kept on asking him what was up, until he finally told us one day. He was having the same experience as I had been having when he moved into my old room, but he didn't care because it interested him. My family is really religious except for him. He decided that he didn't want anything to do with religion at a pretty young age and we all just let him do his thing because we didn't want that to come between us. He told us that he had been looking into black magic and stuff like that. I don't really understand it so I won't pretend I know what I'm talking about. But he said that he was messing around with spells and stuff for kicks and one night he woke up to a shadow figure peeking at him from in the closet. And when he got up to tell me off for trying to scare him, it rushed to him and disappeared into thin air. It turns out, the banging around I heard that one night was him trying to figure out what could have made him see that because, as I said before, he didn't believe that kind of stuff existed. It got worse over time, with things like that being a regular occurrence and eventually, the rest of us having to deal with weird stuff going on. But I won't write down, because this is already long enough. Maybe some other time. He still plays around with tarot cards and has even talked about trying to get hold of a Ouija board on occasion. So I'm not exactly sure what to do about it. But he'll go off to university soon enough. And I'm going off to the army this summer to pay for the schooling I've been doing. So I guess he'll have to try and figure out things for himself. If anyone has any suggestions on how I can help him out, I'd be happy to hear them. I mean, he is my brother. So if I want him to mess with stuff, neither of us understands and get into some trouble, I can't get him out of. Ever since I was a child, I've always drawn in spirits or others. I usually don't pay my gifts any mind when I was younger, but nowadays, I'm trying to get back into the mood of things. I have many scary tales to tell, but this one will be about an apartment I lived in for a few years, when I was around nine. The apartments I lived in were brand new, as in my family was the first to live in them, and they were just finished being built by my province's government. In Canada, the government used schools known as residential or day schools to forcefully assimilate the indigenous population. The majority of these schools murdered and abused many of the children who would have to attend as young as three years old until they were 18. The old residential school sat in the next field over and was turned into an office building before it was inevitably torn down. My aunt worked in that building and I visited her there often. In the bathroom stalls were carved Mary got a baby. This will be key later. The new apartment buildings were unfortunately built on top of unmarked graves of the children who attended the local residential school. The first day in our new home was awesome. 
It was just my mother, my sister and me. Our local government built our apartments for single parent housing. It was everything we wanted, especially for my sister and I, as now we didn't have to share a room. All three of us settled in, my mom's bed to sleep, we laid there, talking about how happy we were. At that point in time, we were only lived in two bedroom basement suites and never thought we'd be on the top floor with our own rooms. We slept in our mom's bed the first night. At around midnight, we were all still awake and we heard children giggling and the sound of marbles rolling on the floor, with little feet running above our heads. I looked to my mother and said, who is that? To which she replied tiredly, it must be the upstairs neighbours. I didn't think twice until my sister turned and said, but mommy, we're the upstairs neighbours. We didn't get much sleep that night. A few months went by with more and more activities. Our family had gotten so aggressive with each other, and with my sister reaching teenagehood, she became ruthless and cruel. She'd scream and slam doors, chase me around the apartment till I had to lock myself in. I once spent four hours locked in the laundry room because she wouldn't stop. I spent a lot of time mulling in my room, which just so happened to be the most active part of the house. We think it's because I was so sad and defeated, whatever it was like to feed on that, let alone my sister's anger. My room was different. Its doorway had a corridor so you couldn't see out or in unless you walked through it. To combat that, I had an old fat back television from the 90s. It sat on an angle in the opposite corner of the door, which meant I could see past the corridor and down our hallway through the reflection. Next to that was an antique desk that we got a few years before we moved at a local antique shop. At bedtime, I'd fallen asleep watching Little Bear or Winnie the Pooh. My mother would come in and turn the TV off when she knew I was sleeping. She'd also turn my bedside lamp off, which proved to be a problem. Every night at 3am, my television would turn on by itself, and every night, the ringing sound of it booting up would wake me. When this would happen, my closet door would be slid open, and the hockey stick would be on the floor or even leaning against the wall. Inside the closet, you could make out a big shadow. If it were to stand, I'd guess it'd be almost seven feet tall, but it was always hunched over, crouched in the corner of my closet. I'd rush to flick my lamp on and it'd be gone. I rarely got any sleep at all, and although the shadow seemed malicious and acted as a poltergeist, it felt comforting, as it was always there when my family life was going down the drain. When I did sleep, I'd have loving dreams of a man caring for me and holding me when I felt sad, and I could physically feel the hugs. One time, my mother was off to work and kissed my forehead goodbye. She left, and it was just me at the house when I was half asleep, eyes closed. I felt a pair of arms hug me tight. So tight I couldn't move. I believe my mother came back to hold me again, so I opened my eyes to say goodbye once more. And I realised no one was there, and it was still holding me. Broad daylight, eyes open. It finally let go, and I sat up and rushed to the living room and went on with my day. Some days I would fall asleep early, when I was too knackered after school. One of those days, I was woken by my TV like clockwork at three. I got up to turn it off, when I saw a girl in a white nightgown standing in my doorway in the reflection of the television. I assumed it was my sister and got mad at her for just standing there and to crawl into my bed if she wanted to sleep with me, to which I got no response. I stormed into my corridor to see no one standing there and just in time to witness her long black hair running into the bathroom, diagonally opposite of my room in the hallway. I rushed to the bathroom and flicked on the light to find myself alone. My mother called out to me and demanded that I stay in her room and she said my sister was gone to a sleepover after I had gone to bed. Not long after all this activity, my mother refused to let me sleep in my room. I still spent most of my time in there, writing or drawing at my desk next to my window. Most of my friends lived in the same buildings as me, and I had become so depressed, I used to watch them playing from my window. A couple of times they told me they witnessed a man standing behind me as I would stare at them. I spent hours at that desk and wrote many stories. One day, I was underneath it, grabbing a stack of paper. When I looked up to 
to see a carving that read, Mary got a baby. When I came to the realization that this specific desk is from when the residential school was in operation, not long after this discovery, and later confirmed by my aunt, did we move out, but when, as we were loading up and moving the truck, a neighbor saw the desk and decided to take it for themselves. We still to this day don't know who took it, but I have prayers for them that they don't suffer the way I did and still currently do. Whatever resides in my closet still to this day is attached to me. Well over a decade and two provinces later, it's still there. Now that I'm trying to be more in tune, maybe I'll figure it out once and for all. A little backstory. My wife's grandma died in April, not COVID related. My father-in-law got the house and being 70 and alone, didn't want to move and live in the bigger house alone. So we basically gave it to my wife, I and our twin girls. Here's a list of events and some logical explanations, if I have one. Just after Grams passed, my father-in-law was staying at the house to keep a presence there so no one would think it was abandoned. He was working on a puzzle at the kitchen table, so he had a lamp on the table. When he went to bed, he left the lamp on. The next morning, the lamp was off, but the overhead light in the next room was on. This is the room where she passed, and that light was on the whole time she was in her last days. Explanation, father-in-law is 17 and just lost his mother. Maybe he didn't remember switching the lights. We shut our door to our room when we shower so we don't wake up the girls. I was in the shower and my wife was in the closet organizing it. She comes into the shower and asks if I went outside. I say no. She tells me that our bedroom door is open and she was sure it was shut before she went into the closet. Explanation, the door swings open if not completely shut. Maybe she didn't get it latched. I was in the basement putting some stuff away. I grabbed water out of my mini fridge, and when I did, I heard the sound of cardboard sliding. It sounded like it came from the other side of the basement. Explanation. None. Almost shit myself and booked it out of there. My wife was looking at things on one of the shelves we have yet to start to go through. I remember her finding a bag of those green plastic army men and the little cowboys and Indian toys. Later... While sitting at my table working on RC cars, I saw something fall out of the corner of my eye. It was that shelf area. A bag with who knows what inside of it fell, I picked it up and stuffed it into a box. Me and the wife were in the basement. She was painting canvases and I was wrenching on RC cars. Out of nowhere, some metal wire shelves that were leaning up against the wall went bang and rang out. The wife yelled at me and asked what I was doing. I was like 10 feet away from the shelves, sitting in a chair with my back to the shelves. I went and looked at the shelves. Something fell and hit them. I'm not sure what, as the basement is a total mess right now and I don't know what was there. After the wife got done painting, she sat at the table across from me and read. We both heard a cardboard box slide from the opposite side of the room from the shelves. I then said loudly, could you please quit moving stuff? This was back a few years ago when I was in high school. I didn't have a cell phone at the time and was dropped off at my house by a classmate who had a car. Usually when I got home back then, someone would be home, whether it be my mom or one of my siblings. On this day, however, I walked into my house to find it completely empty. I immediately had a weird feeling creep over me and began walking around, calling out to see if anyone was in their rooms. We had a landline at the time, so I used it to call my mom to see where everyone was. Of course, there was no answer. I then decided to make some food and start on some homework at the kitchen table. From the kitchen table in my parents' house, you can see into the stairway leading down into the basement. The stairs stop halfway down and turn the other way with a landing in the middle. On the wall above the landing, there's a mirror that allows you to see the basement from the top of the stairs. As I'm eating my food and flipping through a notebook, 
I began to hear noises and faint talking coming from the basement. I was excited because I assumed someone was home and I walked downstairs in hopes of finding my brother or mom. As soon as I turned the corner, I could tell all the lights were off, which meant it was unlikely anyone was indeed down there. Hello? No response. At this point, I'm pretty weirded out and walked slowly back to the kitchen table to keep eating and pretended I wasn't a little freaked out. I kept glancing over my shoulder down the stairwell into the dark mirror, being a bit paranoid. A few minutes later, I start to hear the same faint talking noises from the basement. My spine sent a shiver and I slowly peered over the table and into the stairway at the mirror on the wall. The noises stopped and the air was still. <laughs> right next to my head was a deep, low and masculine laugh let out so loud that I jumped out of my chair and smashed onto the floor. I was a wreck and ran so fast out of my house and into the driveway. I couldn't comprehend what had just happened and kept pacing outside nervously until finally my family came home an hour later. They had been at my brother's swim meet all afternoon and of course none of them took my story very seriously. I get chills thinking about this incident and I've never found a logical explanation. This happened when I was roughly six or seven years old. The memory starts after I was already in bed. I lived in central Virginia at the time and it must have been late summer because it was so hot and muggy. We didn't have AC in the house and often slept with the windows open as a result. To give everyone just the general setup, my room was on the second story of the house and had two windows. One was directly opposite my bed, which was a normal twin size bed and the other was on the right hand side wall. When in the bed, to the left there was a closet and on the wall where my bed was directly to my left was my bedroom door. Directly across the hall from my bedroom was our bathroom and my parents' room was down the hall on the opposite side of the house. Back to that night, it was so hot and muggy. I don't know what woke me up, but I've always, even now, been extremely intolerant of the heat and humidity and sweat very easily. I remember that I only had a sheet over me, no blanket, and it was sticking to my feet specifically because they were sweating. My first memory is waking up laying on my stomach and knowing that my feet were sweating and sticking to me. So I pulled the sheets up to expose my feet so the air could get to them. As soon as I did, I remember very distinctively hearing heavy labored breathing. And that's when fear started as I was in the room by myself and the breathing was not my own. I remember even holding my breath and the breathing continued. It wasn't fast like hyperventilating or anything, but steady and loud. I froze. I remember opening my eyes and my head was turned to my left, towards the right hand side of the room near the farthest window. I could very clearly see the room illuminated in light from the window. I assume it was close to a full moon, because this being in the country, there were no lights outside, but my room was just bathed in blue light, but there was nothing there. The breathing sound continued unabated. I slowly rolled over as if to roll on my back and that's when I saw it. To this day, I have no clue what it was. It was a figure that at the time I described as a gorilla. However, even now as I type this, I can remember what it looked like and it really didn't look like a gorilla. It was tall and nearly reached the ceiling, which was probably about eight feet. And it was wide. It was wider than my bed. There was clearly a head because I could see its eyes, but no other discernible features. It was the blackest black I've ever seen. Even though the light showed through the window to me, now, right, it had no detail whatsoever, as if it were completely void of light. It stood directly in between my bed and the window opposite of it, and it wasn't translucent or like a shadow or anything. It looked clearly like a solid object. Though I could make out its head, there was no neck or very little, and instead went directly into very broad shoulders with two easily identifiable arms that hung down on either side of it. I don't remember specifically if it had definable legs or not, but I saw something. 
This all happened very quickly as well, and the whole event probably only lasted a few minutes at best, but trying to be as detailed as to what I remember. As soon as I realized that something was there, I started screaming for my mother and slid up in the bed so my back was against the headboard. As soon as I moved, it moved by reaching its arms up in my direction, never making any other noise than the breathing. It never actually touched me, but in my memory, when it began moving, I could then see the window behind it on either side where its arms had been. I kept out of the bed to my left, opened the door, and ran across the hall into the bathroom, turned on the light, and then turned to slam the door behind me. As I closed the door, I could see it clearly standing in the exact same place it had been in my room. It didn't chase me. There was a time after waking up, but I could have realistically woke up. As skeptical as I am, there's just no way this was a dream. I remember sitting down on the toilet and pulling my knees up to my chest and wrapping my hands around my legs and being terrified, this whole time just screaming. The door opened suddenly and it was my mother and that's where the memory ends. The last thing I remember is seeing my mother walk through that door. My mother remembers this night very clearly as well, and though I've heard her side before last night, I talked to her about it to refresh what she remembers. She says that she woke up hearing me screaming and remembers trying to wake father up and being irritated that once again he wouldn't budge. Apparently, I had nightmares and screaming wasn't unusual, though I don't really remember any earlier. She heard the doors slam after she had already woken up to my screaming and came to the bathroom as she saw the light was on instead of my bedroom. She said she opened the door and I was sitting there on the toilet holding my knees to my chest, rocking back and forth, and that I was pale as a ghost. She came in and went to pick me up and tried to calm me down and I passed out in her arms. Though I don't remember personally passing out or her coming in to pick me up, the last thing I remember is just seeing her face as she opened the bathroom door. She says that once I woke up, I told her about the gorilla as I described it, and that by this point, my screams had woken up both of my sisters, and at some point, the commotion had woken up my father as well. She remembers how adamant I was, that I wouldn't even let her take me out of the bathroom and in her words from last night, I was having a fit like a damned autistic child. She said it was very unusual compared to what she normally experienced when I had a bad dream, as usually she would find me in bed and usually just had to lie down with me until I fell back asleep, and that it was all out of character for me at the time. As such, her mind instantly went to an intruder, not a monster, and her and my father were worried someone had broken into the house. She made him go through all of the rooms to check and make sure no one was there, and remembers even sending him outside with a flashlight just to be sure, because it unnerved her so badly at how adamant I was. Even then, that it was not just a dream, and that something really had been in my room that night. Apparently, it took me more than a week to even go back to my room again, and longer to go in there after nightfall. I slept with them for about two weeks or so after the event happened. She also says that's when the bad nightmares for me started, which after taking me to a doctor, they ascribed to waking night terrors, because I would, according to me, be completely awake and alert, but see horrible things. I never saw that same thing again, and have never seen it since. I did have a few that were recurring, but always the same. The main likeness between was that there was never a point where I woke up in my own mind, and usually they never stopped until someone else entered my room. To this day, I cannot sleep with my feet uncovered, even in the hottest environments. And if I wake up in the middle of the night, and there an intense, paralyzing fear comes over me, unlike anything I can rationally describe. I don't know why that's connected at all, or just something my mind has connected, but even if it's just my feet, if they're uncovered, I simply can't and won't sleep. That night has become almost folklore in my immediate family, because everyone remembers my reaction and they jokingly teased me through the years about Kudos Gorilla, just because it sounds so crazy, and I've always maintained, as I do to this day, that it was not just a dream. I have no clue what it was I saw standing in my room that night, or why it affected me the way it is, 
more so than any experience I've had since. But 20 years later, there's still absolutely no doubt in my mind whatsoever about the way those events transpired. I grew out of the night terrors mostly around 11 or 12 years old, and very rarely dream at all anymore. Once in a blue moon, I still have a wailing night terror reminiscent of the ones I did when I was little, that ranged from feeling something walk around or feel around on my bed as if to find me, the feeling of having the covers slowly pulled down off of me as if someone is standing at the foot of my bed, or the overwhelming feeling similar to what some describe in sleep paralysis, as if there's something in the upper corner of the room intently staring at me, even though that's completely illogical. And during all of these, I never lose the ability to move or speak or anything. As an adult, I'm a lot better at calming myself down and convincing myself it's all just part of an overactive imagination, thankfully. It happened in all different types of physical settings in different houses. And even as an adult, I've had it happen with my partner lying right next to me. But nowadays, never as interactive or out in the open as it was then. <laughs>